Welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense ongoing coverage of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Today was the sixth day of the trial by which Assistant DA Thomas Binger is seeking to have Kyle Rittenhouse convicted and sentenced to life in prison for having shot three men too fatally the night of August 25th, 2020 in Kenosha, Wisconsin, when the city was suffering a tsunami of rioting, looting, and arson following the lawful shooting of a knife-wielding Jacob Blake by Kenosha police officers. Well, I imagine those of you following my coverage of this trial are beginning to feel like you are caught in Law of Self-Defense Groundhog Day edition because every day seems to be a repeat of the same general theme that it was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day for the prosecution. And I'm afraid today was no different. Now, before I dive into the meat of the day, I would like to thank our sponsor of today's content, which is CCW Safe. CCW Safe is a provider of legal service memberships, what many people mistakenly call self defense insurance. In effect, CCW Safe promises to pay its members legal expenses if the member is involved in a use of force event. And those expenses start big and get bigger fast, folks. If you've been compelled to kill somebody in self defense, it's easy to burn through $200,000 before you even get to trial on a murder or manslaughter charge. So if you don't have that kind of money sitting in a mattress, just in case you are compelled to defend yourself or your family, it can be helpful to have a partner standing behind you to make sure you have the resources you need to fight that legal battle the way you want it fought, as if the rest of your life depends on it, because really it does. Now, I've looked at all the companies that offer similar kinds of services, as you might imagine, and I found that CCW Safe is by far the best fit for me. I'm personally a member. Whether they're the best fit for you is something only you can decide, but I do urge you to take a look at what they have to offer by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash CCW Safe. And if you do decide to become a member there, you can use the discount code LOSD10 for Law of Self Defense and the number 10. At that URL, lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. Now, before we dive into the actual testimony itself, I do want to mention some top-level things that happened today. One is that the curfew violation charge, count seven in the criminal complaint against Kyle, has been dropped from the trial. No explanation was given, really, but it hardly matters. It was, at worst, a ticketing offense. The more important implication of that charge being dropped is kind of a negative one. What didn't happen? That is that the illegal gun possession charge, count six, remains. This is a travesty, both because a plain reading of the relevant gun statutes would appear to exempt Kyle, and in any case, the statutes themselves are so ambiguous as to be unconstitutionally vague and probably not understandable to a lay jury. It's always been my position that the gun count ought to be dismissed, but I'm not the judge, so here we are. Also today, Judge Schroeder instructed the jury that they were to disregard in its entirety the testimony on the first day of trial of FBI Special Agent Brandon Crayman. Uh, Crayman spoke, of course, to the uh, FBI aerial video footage that's been used in this trial. The reason given to the jury was that the testimony had proved incomplete. As it happens, Crayman was the only witness of the trial whose testimony was not broadcast from the courtroom, so I didn't see it. So I've never had a substantive opinion on that testimony, but in any case, it's apparently stricken from the case now. And finally, the state officially rested today after presenting its final two witnesses. It should be understood that when the prosecution rests, that's the high watermark for the state's narrative of guilt. Until now, the only witnesses called have been those the state chose to call. To that point, the defense has had no choice whatever in the witnesses presented to the jury so far. Unfortunately for the state, this high watermark more closely resembles a water ring in a dirty toilet. In a case where the primary legal defense is self-defense and where the state therefore bears the burden of disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, the prosecution appears to have come nowhere close to meeting that burden. From this day forward, it will be the defense choosing the witnesses to present to the jury. And the defense certainly started off with a bang today, as I'll cover in more detail in a moment. Effectively, this means that as weak as the prosecution's case is today, it can only get weaker moving forward. And that is, of course, good news for Kyle Rittenhouse. But having said that, the risks of a conviction are never zero, even for the most innocent of defendants. And of course, even for the acquitted defendant, the process itself is its own punishment. 
Now, many people have wondered if the defense would make a motion for a directed verdict. This is a, a motion arguing to the judge that no reasonable jury could convict based on the state's case in chief and that the effectively asking the judge to take the matter out of the hands of the jury and render a verdict himself. Motions for a directed verdict are made as a matter of routine, certainly in almost every criminal case I've ever been involved in, and they are as routinely denied. The best path to a directed verdict is where the prosecution has simply produced zero evidence on some element of the underlying crime, or in the context of this case, zero evidence attacking some element of self-defense. Once virtually any evidence has been presented, however, most judges are loath to take from the jury their role in being the weigher of evidence, the finders of fact, and barely more than zero evidence is therefore enough to deny a motion for a directed verdict. I'm presuming that in this case, the motion uh, was made by the defense in the usual way and the judge denied it in the usual way, although I did see nothing in court discussing such a motion explicitly. But in any case, whether it was made and denied or not bothered to be made at all, the outcome is the same. The judge is not rendering a verdict in this case, and the defense today began to present its own case in chief. So let's first look at the state's final witnesses. The state's two final witnesses were James Armstrong, an imaging expert witness, and Dr. Doug Kelly, the medical examiner in the autopsies of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber. In a nutshell, Armstrong really did nothing observable to help the prosecution, and Dr. Kerry affirmatively helped the defense. And this is not at all how state witnesses are supposed to work for the prosecution, and especially not the last two witnesses the jury will hear from before the defense gets their turn. Let's focus on Armstrong first. So Armstrong was brought in by the state to speak to the just discovered unicorn evidence in the form of drone footage that the evidence fairy left on the prosecution's doorstep this past Friday. When I examined this video yesterday, I could discern nothing useful, even on my high-end computer monitor. And Detective Antaramian, who introduced the video yesterday, could only make the most tentative suggestions about what it showed. The detective would claim that he could see Kyle Rittenhouse pointing his rifle towards Joshua Zeminski in the moments before Rosenbaum began his murderous chase of the 17-year-old. All it took was for the detective to zoom in on the image using his smartphone. He also claimed that Rosenbaum was feet away from Rittenhouse at the time he was shot. Well, I zoomed in using a giant 4K IMAX screen and saw nothing of the sort. Presumably, Armstrong was supposed to come in with some video magic pixie dust and show the jury what the prosecution needed to be shown. Unfortunately for the state, the enhanced video and Armstrong's testimony still failed to show, at least to this small town lawyer's eye, anything like what was claimed by the detective yesterday. As far as I can tell, this drone video is a total bust for the prosecution and perhaps a help for the defense because it provides yet another view of Rosenbaum chasing down the fleeing Rittenhouse. Now, of course, the video of the direct and cross-examination testimony of Armstrong is embedded in the text version of today's content, as is the testimony of every witness I'll talk about uh, throughout this content. The next and final state witness for this trial was Dr. Doug Kelly, the medical examiner who performed the autopsies of both Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber. The most notable aspect of Dr. Kelly's testimony was how visibly uncomfortable he was under direct examination by Assistant DA Kraus. Kraus repeatedly attempted to press Dr. Kelly into providing testimony that the good doctor was clearly not comfortable providing. It was quite noticeable. With Kraus proposing some zany interpretation of the autopsy findings that might support the state's theory of the case and Dr. Kelly visibly hesitating before simply disagreeing. Key to the state's questioning of Dr. Kelly was their desire to have him testify that both Rosenbaum and Huber were further from Rittenhouse than the video evidence would suggest. Of key importance to this was the analysis of soot and gunpowder stippling around the bullet entrance wounds. In short, soot marks are generally found only when the muzzle is within a few inches of the wound and gunpowder stippling only when the muzzle is within four feet or less of the wound. In one example of Krauss pressing Dr. Kerry to lengthen the distance at which Kyle fired in the video of the shooting of Rosenbaum, a large cloud of smoke can be seen coming from the muzzle of Kyle's rifle. Wouldn't all that smoke mean that the stippling found on Rosenbaum might have traveled a much further distance than is typically the case, Krauss suggested, and that therefore Rosenbaum could have been farther from Kyle when he shot than the other evidence might indicate? 
Carrie hesitated, then replied that soot and gunpowder flex have the kinetic energy needed to travel and mark a target. Smoke does not. Ouch. At other times, Dr. Carey suggested that the only way to answer the hypotheticals posed by the state would be to test fire the rifle. But that just highlighted that such test firing had not been done by the state, most likely because they were afraid the answer would be unfavorable to their prosecution. They would, of course, have had to share the results of such testing with the defense. On cross-examination by defense counsel Richards, Kerry testified that the gunshot wounds and injuries to both Rosenbaum and Huber were entirely consistent with the men being in a position of attack upon Rittenhouse when they were shot. Even the fatal shot to Rosenbaum's back, which was likely inflicted when the aggressor made a diving lunge at Kyle's rifle. In particular, the soot pattern on the right hand of Rosenbaum suggested that it had been on the muzzle of the rifle when that hand was shot. On redirect by Assistant DA Kraus, the prosecutor tried to suggest that the soot on the hand might have been the result of Rosenbaum attempting to swipe the muzzle to the side, a kind of defensive motion, and even had Dr. Carey do a demonstration for the jury using Kraus's own hand on the rifle barrel. Unfortunately, Kraus had entirely mistaken which side of the hand the fired bullet had entered. Once this was corrected by Dr. Carey, he pointed out that really the only way the soot pattern observed could have been created was with the hand on the muzzle in the manner suggested by defense counsel Richards. Dr. Carey even used the term Superman position to describe the lunging hands forward body position of Rosenbaum that would explain his wound patterns, particularly the fourth fatal shot to the back. So unsatisfied was the state with their own medical examiner that they not only subject him to direct examination, of course, they then also subject him to redirect and ultimately to re-redirect. Not that it helped, as defense effectively cross-examined in each instance. Overall, the testimony of Dr. Curry wasn't even close in terms of which party it favored. It was entirely consistent with the self-defense narrative of the defense in a case where the state is obliged to disprove self-defense beyond any reasonable doubt. And with that, the state rested its case and it was the turn of the defense to steer the trial. So the defense presented four witnesses today, the first three of which were substantive, Nicholas Smith, and Joanne Fiedler, both of whom accompanied Kyle to protect property the night of August 25th, 2020, and Nathan DeBruin, an amateur photographer, perhaps best known for his photo of Kyle cleaning graffiti from the local high school. For all three of these witnesses, the testimony was both entirely consistent with the legal defense of self-defense and substantively undermined much of the already weak foundation underlying the case in chief the prosecution had spent the last week presenting to the jury. A key value of the appearance of Nicholas Smith here was his testimony indicating that the car source owners had explicitly requested, gratefully accepted, and offered to pay for the protection and assistance of himself, Kyle, Ryan Balch, and the others at the car source location that night. Further, he testified that the owners had provided the protectors with keys and other means of access to the properties. Smith would work alongside Kyle, Ryan Balch, Jason Lakowski, and Joanne Fiedler, the next defense witness, among others, to accomplish precisely this, the protection of the property. Smith's testimony was vastly more credible than the confused and apparently stoned testimony of Sal and Sam Kindry, the owners of CarSource, which they had presented on the part of the state, in which they ridiculously purported to have no particular knowledge of all these armed men on their properties. When subject to cross-examination by Assistant DA Binger, Smith not only provided no testimony harmful to the defense, he provided an opportunity for Binger to present as little more than snide, sneering, and flailing, and it wasn't a good look. Smith also testified about Kyle's shocking demeanor in the aftermath of the shootings and his urging of Kyle to turn himself into authorities, which, of course, Kyle had already attempted and which he would do later that evening in nearby Antioch, Illinois. The second defense witness today uh, was Joanne Fiedler. Uh, the value of this witness to the defense was substantially greater than even the very positive contribution to Smith. Like him, she also testified that she had personally met with the car source owners, that they were appreciative of the protection offered, and that the protectors had certainly never been told to leave the property, for example. She would work alongside Kyle Smith, Ryan Balch, and the others 
to do precisely this, protect that car source property. Fiedler also, however, provided substantive eyewitness testimony about the antics of Joseph Rosenbaum and others, with a breadth of personal knowledge broader than what the jury had previously seen in this trial. In addition, she effectively exposed the state's position as ridiculously weak on several points where they sought to challenge or impeach her testimony only to have her directly contradict the state's claims and exposing the state as having no substantive evidence to back up their accusations. She also injected some, frankly, much-needed humor into the proceedings. Fiedler, who might be described as a little old lady, although in fairness, I'm not sure she's any older than me, presented as patriotic and civic-minded without, importantly, presenting as militia or boogaloo. She testified about how some protesters outside the car source were aggressively seeking to provoke a physical confrontation, urging her to put away her gun, which was a three eighty caliber pistol, and come out in the street, getting increasingly angry and strident with her when she refused to repeat their own fist-in-the-air power salute and so on. She also testified extensively about the antics of Rosenbaum, including his apparently throwing an object moments before the protectors found themselves the victim of a gas bomb attack. On cross-examination, Assistant DA Binger suggested that she had withheld from investigators video evidence that she had shared with Kyle's defense attorneys. When she flatly denied this, Binger had no actual evidence to the contrary with which to impeach her denial. Assistant DA Binger repeatedly attempted to suggest that Fiedler was prepared to kill in order to protect the car source property deliberately conflating the notion of being lawfully armed while defending property on the one hand and the notion of using that deadly weapon to kill in defense of property on the other. Fiedler consistently insisted her gun was for her own protection and to act as a deterrent in the protection of property, not to kill in the protection of property. Ultimately, Judge Schroeder made clear to the jury the use of force distinction being conflated by Binger, and that pretty much put an end to that particular charade. Binger accused Fiedler of having told investigators that she'd had no actual communication with the car source owners, which again, she flatly denied. At one point, Binger decided to revisit his Rosenbaum was only five foot three. He couldn't be a deadly threat to anybody argument and fell flat on his face. When Rosenbaum's slight stature was presented to Fiedler for this purpose, she responded, well, he's about the same size as me. Turns out that Joanne Fiedler herself is only five foot four inches tall. At times, Binger's cross-examination of Fiedler became outright incoherent, with he and Fiedler clearly talking about different locations and times without themselves realizing they were at cross-communications. And of course, it's not the job of the witness being cross-examined to keep the questioning coherent. In short, Fiedler was a very capable witness for the defense narrative of self-defense and further undermined the narrative of guilt of the state. And then we get to the third defense witness of the day, perhaps the most powerful witness of the day for the defense, uh, but one that might have seemed the least likely. And this was Nathan De Bruin, an amateur photographer who took a great many photos the night of August 25th, 2020 in Kenosha, as well as on previous nights. Indeed, it was De Bruin who took the now famous image capturing Kyle, among others, cleaning graffiti off the walls of the local high school, the very high school he had himself attended. I say that De Bruin seemed an unlikely candidate to be the defense's most powerful witness of the day because he presented as and conceded having extreme anxiety, and he also suffers from a rather prominent speech impediment. Despite this, De Bruin was absolutely coherent and firm in his testimony, almost driving Assistant DA Krauss into a rage with his calm and cool testimony that was so helpful to the defense and so damaging to the prosecution. Indeed, at times, Assistant DA Krauss's cross-examination of De Bruin became completely unprofessional and almost personally bullying. Perhaps nothing was as damaging to the prosecution and as personally infuriating to Assistant DA Krause as De Bruin's testimony that in a meeting with Assistant DA Binger and Krause, he had the perception they were asking him to change his statement to police about what he had observed the night of the 25th. And here, change should be read to mean falsify, in particular to falsify some conduct or presence of Joshua Zeminski. Indeed, immediately after that meeting with prosecutors in which De Bruin refused to change a word of his prior statement, he immediately left and retained his own legal counsel, and that counsel was present in the courtroom during De Bruin's testimony today. 
Assistant DA Krause almost shouted his accusatory questions at De Bruin on cross-examination. Isn't it true you have a bias favoring the defense in this case, that you don't want Rittenhouse convicted? Not true, answered De Bruin. Then why did you give an interview to a blog that has published many, many articles critical of myself and of Assistant DA Binger? And frankly, folks, really this display of personal affront by Krause was completely unprofessional. De Bruin's answer for why he gave the interview? Well, they asked me. Isn't it true that you knew the blogger you provided an interview to has a bias against this prosecutor's office? Tell us what you know about his bias. At this point, even Judge Schroeder had enough, interjecting, wait, you're asking this witness to testify about the alleged bias of some other person? Uh, yeah, that's not happening. Almost as maddening to Kraus was the many photos and personal observations De Bruin had taken of Rosenbaum engaged in conduct that was helpful to the defense and harmful to the prosecution. Need an eyewitness with photos to testify about Rosenbaum holding a chain? De Bruin's your guy. An eyewitness to testify about Rosenbaum's threatening, violent, provocative conduct towards others needing to be held back from attacking? Have you met Nathan De Bruin? Eyewitness testimony of Rosenbaum tipping over porta potties, dragging trailers that would later be aflame into the street, hearing Rosenbaum scream that he'd just gotten out of jail and wasn't afraid to go back, seeing Rosenbaum get angry when the dumpster fire was put out, hearing Rosenbaum shout, F the police and shoot me N word repeatedly. Well, we've got your witness. Need someone to testify that he saw Huber strike Rittenhouse repeatedly with a skateboard, that Huber's hand then fought for control of Kyle's gun, that Grosskreutz had approached a fallen Rittenhouse with a gun in his hand? That's Nathan De Bruin. On cross-examination by Assistant DA Kraus, De Bruin had repeatedly characterized the meeting with Assistant DA Binger and Kraus, in which he felt they were asking him to falsify his police statement as one that was very tense and uncomfortable. Now Kraus proposed, isn't it true that our meeting was congenial and uneventful? De Bruin answered, you mean aside from all the uncomfortable tension? When Kraus demanded why De Bruin had forgotten to mention important details in his police statement, such that Grosskreutz had a gun in his hand, uh, that he later remembered when interviewed by the defense, De Bruin looked straight at him and answered, hey, I'm not a police detective or prosecutor. I don't know what you think is important. That one left a mark. Honestly, if you don't have time to enjoy any other uh, video of the testimony today, I recommend you prioritize the testimony of De Bruin and particularly his cross-examination testimony under the tender mercies of the nearly hysterical Kraus. In the end, it was pretty evident that as angry as Kraus was with De Bruin, the amateur photographer had little but contempt for the assistant district attorney. And in that matchup, De Bruin was the clear winner. Now, the final defense witness of the day was one Lucas Zanin. His testimony was not particularly substantive. It was offered by the defense at the end of the day as foundational evidence to support the admission into evidence of a cell phone video of the shooting of Rosenbaum in the car source parking lot. This video was taken by Zanin's stepdaughter as the two of them sat in his car parked across the street from the lot. Uh, frankly, the video appeared of terrible quality and limited of any utility. So I don't really know what the purpose of this was. I certainly couldn't discern anything very important in the video, and Zanin had not observed much of any real value personally. That said, when subject briefly to cross-examination by Assistant D.A. Krauss, Zanin began to wax poetically about the sorrow he felt at the terrible destruction the ravaging, invading horde had inflicted on the city in which he'd been born and raised— and that certainly did nothing to hurt the defense narrative of self-defense. Indeed, I almost suspected that the defense had, in fact, snuck Zanin in as a booby trap witness precisely for the state to fall into that trap. But that would be pretty diabolical. All right, folks, uh, that's all I have for you on this topic tonight. Uh, don't forget to join us again tomorrow morning at Legal Insurrection for our live coverage of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial as it enters its seventh day. Remember, if you carry a gun so you're hard to kill, that's why I carry a gun, so I'm hard to kill, my family is hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict. Until tomorrow morning, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.